I want to thank, thank God and the church for one more opportunity to come before you and minister from the word. If it's your first time with us today, welcome to church. Some of my friends from college came today. They didn't realize I was speaking. They were just coming today. So I'm glad you guys are here too. So today I have an assignment and I want to honor God, but I also want to, want to honor each and every one of you. But to do that, we'll be looking at a couple of different portions in the Bible. But while you're turning to Numbers 25, Reuben Chach is going to pull up 2 Timothy chapter 3. And I'm just going to read it. You don't have to turn there. It says, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. Now, the reason I'm starting with this scripture this morning is for two reasons. Number one, we're going to be looking at some Old Testament scripture. And sometimes in Christendom, there's this weird thing we do where we don't want to look at Old Testament scripture the same way we look at New Testament scripture, and we kind of separate it out. But like it says in 2 Timothy, all scripture is breathed out by God. And at the same time, what does that mean? It's life-giving. The same God who put breath into Adam's life, put breath into his word for each and every one of us today. And secondly, the reason I'm saying this is some of the scriptures we look at aren't your typical Sunday morning passages. And a lot of times when something is hard in the Bible or something is challenging, we have a tendency to pull back from what God is trying to say. But this morning, what I want you to know is the word of God is not always an encouragement to you. It's sometimes profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and training in righteousness. And why do we say all that? It says in verse 17, so that the man of God may be complete. And my prayer throughout this week and even last night as I was praying for each and every one of you is that today through the word, even if you're feeling challenged, even if you're feeling convicted, you would be made complete in Christ through it. So with that, the title of my message today is Jealous with My Jealousy. And what we're going to do is we'll be looking at Numbers chapter 25 and Cursed Corinthians chapter 5. But while you're turning to Numbers, I want to start with a question for you today. When it comes to the church, what motivates you to make change? See, we can all have different goals and desires that are driving us in the world to pursue our ambitions. But specifically in the church context, what drives you? See, in the past for me, I know I've fallen short because I've been more focused on the brand of Hebron or a logo than actually what God is calling us to be focused. Or in my own pride, I've been short to fall to think, I want people to think I'm great, so that's why I'll make change at church. But today, what I want to do is look at different scriptures to see what God is calling us to do to make change at our church. So with that, we're going to read through the book of Numbers Starting in verse 1 of chapter 25, it says, While Israel is in Shittim, the people began to whore with the daughters of Moab. These invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel yoked himself to the Baal of Peor, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. Now, to start in this passage, I want you to remember that the people of Israel have gone through a long journey. In Numbers chapter 1, what you see happen is God commands Moses to take a census of the people and count how many people have come out of Egypt two years after they left Egypt. But when we're in this chapter, we're not just one year later or two years later. We're actually many, many years later because in the next chapter, God is going to command Moses to take one more census because a whole different generation has come out of the land of Egypt now. And what we see happen is that the journey of the Israelites to the promised land is a long one because they keep making different choices that lead them away from God. And what happens in this chapter is once again, they're making a choice that's pulling them away from God. And if you actually look at the geography of the land, they were only 10 kilometers from the promised land. They were so close to everything God was calling them to do, but once again, they make a mistake of letting things draw them away from God. Now, what is their mistake in this passage? It says that the people began to whore or go after the daughters of Moab and Midianites. And when you're reading that passage, you might be thinking, oh, they just 
falling into their sinful desires or they're falling into their lust. But what you actually learn is that when you study the Bible, the people of Moab and Midian aren't just one-off occurrences. And if you look closely, in the last two chapters, the king of Moab was actually trying to get a prophet named Balaam to curse the people. And as he's trying to do that, we see that God stops that intervention and he is unsuccessful. But what you see happen is now that the um, king wasn't able to get the prophet to curse the people on behalf of God, a new strategy occurs. They end up trying to seduce the men of the land. And what happens is the men fall for the bait and they begin to be led astray. And this morning what I want to remind you is that the enemy is going to be trying to do everything he can to get you away from God. And the first thing he'll do is he'll try and get God to curse you. But what do we know? There's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. Neither death, nor life, nor power, nor rulers, nor anything in this world. But what I want you to know is that even though the enemy can't get God to curse you, he sure can get you to walk away from God. And this morning, let's be so careful that we're not trying to walk away from the Lord. See, this is the same strategy the enemy has been working for generation after generation. He'll try and place different things in your life, different idols, different pride, different lust. And you think it's just your struggle. But what it is, is it's the enemy trying to remove you from the Lord's presence. Because he knows when you're with God, he can't do anything. But if he can get you to walk away, we're in a place of danger. So this morning, let's be aware. We see that this sin isn't just a small issue. It leads to all of Israel yoking themselves to the Baal of Peor. See, any sin left untouched doesn't just stop after a while. No, it infects everything around it. And so to the place that all the people began to be yoked to something else. And why is this important? Because since the beginning of the fall of man, God has been trying to separate a group of people for himself. And every time he's trying to do it, he's trying to remind them, I'm a holy God. I'm here for you. I have a redemptive plan. But the people keep going after things that are pulling them away from that plan. So let's keep reading to see what the response is. It says, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. See, what I want you to know is that this is a characteristic we can't ignore about God. He's a holy God. He's a pure God. And when we sin, there is anger that exists because you're breaking his heart. But let's see what God's response is to all this. In verse 4, it says, And the Lord said to Moses, Take all the chiefs of the people and hang them in the sun before the Lord, that the fierce anger of the Lord may turn away from Israel. And Moses said to the judges of Israel, each one of you killed those men who have yoked themselves to the Baal of Peor. See, God's command isn't to just tolerate sin among the people. He tells them, I want you to kill everyone who has yoked themselves here. God's plan is to remove sin completely from the assembly of the people of God. And what we see happen is he tells them not only to kill them, but he wants you to hang them up so that they're in the sun. And to us, that doesn't make much sense if the issue is done. But in that culture, in that time, when God would hang them up, it would be a reminder to everyone in the assembly that their sin had a consequence and that their sin had a price and it needed to be taken care of so that everyone who would stare at them would realize that they shouldn't partake in the same sins of these men. Now, notice, after Moses gets that instruction, what he does is he immediately goes to 70 of the judges. And I want you to keep that in mind. It's not that only Moses knows what God told him. He commands all the judges. And earlier in the book of Numbers, these judges were given to Moses because he felt like he had too great of a burden when he came to leading the people. So remember that. Moses received an instruction from the Lord, and he gives it to other people to share that burden with him. But pay attention to those judges throughout this chapter. Now, you might be thinking God's command to kill these people is really harsh. But notice, he's not saying it because he gets anything out of it. He's saying, you need to kill these people because my wrath is coming against you. And it's out of love. It's out of mercy. I'm telling you, remove this sin from you so that you can be holy too and not face my wrath. 
Now, let's continue to see what happens. In verse 6 through 9, it says, And behold, one of the people of Israel came and brought a Midianite woman to his family, in the sight of Moses and in the sight of the whole congregation of the people of Israel, while they were weeping in the entrance of the tent of meeting. And when Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, son of Aaron, the priest, saw it, he rose and left the congregation and took a spear in his hands. And he went after this man of Israel into the chamber and pierced both of them, the man of Israel and the woman through her belly. Thus the plague of the people of Israel was stopped. Nevertheless, those who died by the plague were 24,000. See, this is what happens when sin becomes normalized. In the assembly of all the people, a man is willing to bring a foreign woman into the presence of everyone. It says into the sight of all. And he does it not only just in a normal day, but while the people are weeping. And why are the people weeping? Because of the wrath of God. A plague has been sent, and many of their own people are dying. But this man without fear is bringing the sin into the assembly of God. And we see, while everyone is looking, only one man takes the decision to stand up. And that man is the grandson of Aaron, the brother of Moses. And what does he do? He gets up instead of just staring. He leaves the congregation. He gets a spear and puts an end to the problem in their midst. And you might say that that looks very harsh. That's very mean. Or why would he stop them from doing what they want? But look what it says. It says the plague upon the people of Israel was stopped. By Phineas taking an action, by him stepping up, he was able to stop the wrath of God that was coming against this group of people. And let's see what God feels about it. When you read in verse 10, it says, And the Lord said to Moses, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, has turned back my wrath from the people of Israel, in that he was jealous with my jealousy among them. So I did not consume the people of Israel in my jealousy. Therefore, say, behold, I give to him a covenant of peace, and it shall be unto him and to his descendants after him, the covenant of perpetual priesthood, because he was jealous for his God, and he made atonement for the people of Israel. See, when we read God's response, clearly he's pleased with Phineas. He's saying while everyone else was just staying, while everyone else was just watching, there was one man who was jealous for what I was jealous for. And when you think of God being a jealous God, this is not God being petty and he wants your attention. No, he's a holy God. And if you're coming to him today, he needs all of you. He doesn't need part of your commitment. He doesn't need part of your devotion. He needs every single area of your life. And look, the motivation for Phineas wasn't that he wants the people around the nations to know that Israel is good or that they have a lot of people. His motivation is I'm jealous for what God is jealous for. And today, are you jealous for what God is jealous for? Do you love what God loves, and moreover, do you hate what he hates? Or are we tolerating pride, lust, anger, different things in our life because we think God is merciful and forgiving? Are we coming to a place where we can be jealous for what God is jealous for? See, today you might also feel like, yo, I'm doing a pretty good job. I'm coming to church. I'm pretty passionate about what God is calling me for. But remember, there were 70 other judges who knew the command, too. What happened to them? Why did they not feel an urge or a burden or a desire to come after what was happening? I'll tell you why. If you read in verse 14, we actually learn the identity of the man and the woman. And it says, The name of the slain man of Israel who killed the Midianite woman was Zimri, the son of Salu, the chief of the father's house belonging to the Simeonites. And the name of the Midianite woman who was killed was Cosby, the daughter of Zer, who was the tribal head of the father's house in Midian. See, the people who were sitting in front of everybody weren't just ordinary citizens. His father was a chief over one of the tribes. And my question today is, does a person's identity or their relation depend on how you're going to react to the sin? See, many of us are willing to call out the sin in people's lives if they're not close to us. But what if it's your son or your daughter or your brother or your sister or somebody who's close to you in church that you've established a relationship with? Are you still jealous for what God is jealous for? Or are you scared of what they might think about you when it comes? And 
what we know is that if you're truly jealous for what God's jealous for, it's not going to matter who it is. Because your driving factor isn't to see them like you. Your driving factor is to see them become holy like God is holy. But unfortunately, what I feel like happens so often in the church today is that we're jealous for what God's jealous for, but we don't call it out among the people here. Our focus is always outward to the world. We care so much about how our coworkers or non-believers are living their life. And this is not an issue that's only present in our church. It was actually present back in the day of Paul. So when you go to the book of 1 Corinthians 5, this is where we're going to see that come to life. This is Paul writing in verse 9, and he says to the church, I wrote to you in my letters not to associate with the sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy and the swindlers or the idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. But I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of a brother if he's guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, a reviler, a drunkard, or a swindler. Not even to eat with such a person. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those within the church whom you are to judge? God will judge those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. And I know that's a tough word to read this morning. That's not something that will bring you comfort, but it is God's word, and we need to acknowledge it. See, he makes this statement because in the midst of all this happening, there's actually sexual immorality going on in the Corinthian church, and there's things that are happening that are unspeakable. But you know what's even more sad? That at the same time all that sin is happening, they're still experiencing spiritual gifts. This church is not lacking in speaking in tongues. This church is not lacking in prophecy. But they're still tolerating sin in the midst of all of that. And Paul is so frustrated. He's so angry. And this is what he comes to say. He says, I want you to know there are two groups of people. Only two. There are the sexually immoral of this world or the unbeliever. People who don't believe in God. And Paul is saying, I'm not talking about these people this morning. He says, no, no, no. For you to avoid those people, you can't function in this world. Think about it. How would we get groceries? How would we buy things? How would we get health care? All these different things. He's not talking about those people. Because to the unbeliever, we only have one message. That's the message, the good news of the gospel. Uh, Jesus saves and you are forgiven. That's the only thing we worry about when it comes to that. I'm not worried about if they're living in sin, because they should be. They don't have the Holy Spirit. But for us today, we need to recognize that if anyone is an unbeliever who hears the gospel, the good news is now bad news. Because you can no longer live the way you're living. You can no longer go about living your life any which way you want. Because the second you call Jesus Lord and Savior in your life, you're acknowledging myself has to die and I am submitted to him. So that brings us to the second group. Anyone who bears the name of a brother. So who is Paul talking about this morning? Each and every one of us. Each and every one of us who say we are Christians. We follow Jesus. And what is he saying? It's anyone who bears the name of a brother if he's guilty of all these different sins. And what if he says, it's not just you stumbled and you're struggling with sin. No, it's you have a habit of living in sin continually. That's who Paul is talking about today. And he goes to the extent of saying, don't even eat with such a person. And I think for some of us, that's kind of hard to think about. How am I not going to eat with my family? How am I not going to eat with them? We've been at the same church for the last 40 years. What am I going to do about that? But Paul is saying, we have this strict command we have this burden, not because we're great, but because sin, when left untouched, has multiple effects. And let's go through those effects. The first reason we're so serious about this is, number one, we have the motive of saving them. See, early in the chapter of 5, Paul tells them, I want you to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, that he might be saved in the day of the Lord. The reason you're abstaining from somebody is not so that they feel the hurt or they feel lonely. No, it's because you don't want to send them a message that you're okay if you keep living in sin. The last thing we want to tell people is that you're fine just because you're among us, sitting here at church. See, you can sit here all you want, but if your life isn't changing, there's absolutely no point in what we're doing this morning. So number one, it's always with the motivation of saving them. 
Number two, it's confusing to the outside world. You have to think, if I bear the name of a believer, but I live any way I want, what message does that send to the world? That tells them, oh, I'm a Christian, but I don't need to change how I'm living. And that unbeliever might be saying, what's the point then? Why should I follow Jesus? If you're a Christian and you live like this, does it even matter? So the reason we don't associate with people who continue to live in sin is it's confusing to the outside world. We don't care about our testimony. We care about the testimony of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I don't want to stain that testimony for the sake of a friendship, for the sake of a family member. I will keep Jesus' name pure this morning. And the final reason is, if left untouched, it can spread among others. See, we saw this earlier in the book of Numbers. Whenever it was just a few people, it didn't stop there. It said that all of Israel was yoked to the Baal of Peor. And even in this passage in 1 Corinthians, Paul says, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. See, our goal shouldn't be just to look at sin and be like, no, that's wrong. It should be to protect those around us. Are we protecting the community, the body of Christ that's entrusted to us? Are we so vigorous and protective that we don't want sin to spread among our congregation this morning? Now, the last thing I want is that, I, the last thing I want is that you hear this and you become cynical of everybody. And that's not my goal. See, we're not doing this because we want others to know that we're great or we want people to think I'm amazing. What I want you to realize is that we're pushing for this because God is holy. And everything we're doing is a byproduct of that. And even Paul, he doesn't want the, um, the believers in Corinth to misunderstand what he's saying. If we turn to chapter 6, verse 9 through 11, this is what Paul says. He says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? And do not be deceived, neither the sexual immoral, nor the idolaters, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. But such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, and you were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. The worship team can start making their way up. But notice... That list of people, Paul says, is the same list from earlier. He's telling them, these people don't inherit the kingdom of God if they live like that. But I don't want you to forget, some of you were these people. And when we're coming with this passion, I need to remember for myself, I was dead in my sins. I was lost. I was far from God. I had no hope. So when I'm coming at my brother or my sister for how they're living, it's not because I'm better. No, it's because I know the redemptive work of Christ that can happen in the believer if he puts his trust in God. But I want you to know, just because you're sitting here doesn't mean you're going to inherit the kingdom of God. You can inherit the kingdom if you live any way you want. And we need to have that full conviction when we're sharing the gospel, when we're discipling one another, when we're coming at it. Now... I don't want to leave this last group out. Today, if you feel like you're the one living in sin, I don't want you to feel isolated. If you feel like you're the one who's been struggling with the same thing over and over, and no matter what you do, you don't know how to get out of it, I don't want to leave you outside either. Because if we go back to that Numbers passage, the same reminder that God did was he made the people be hung if they, sun, if they sinned, so that way they would know that there was a cost for their sin. But today, if you're living in sin, we have an even greater reward. It's that our Jesus was so jealous. He was so zealous for the kingdom of God that what he did was he said, I'll be the one that's hung. He said, I'll be the one who's on the cross. So every time we look at the cross, we know that our sin had a consequence and the wrath of God was satisfied. Do we realize that? And when I look, it's a reminder, not of my own righteousness, not of my own perfection, but of the only hope I had in Jesus Christ, that he was so jealous for the things of God that he died for me. Do we realize that this morning, church? We have hope because of what Jesus has done for us. So if you're living in sin, if you're living away from God, don't stay there. We're here for you as a church. We want to see every member brought into the family of God. We want to see everyone inherit the kingdom of God. That is our hope this morning. 
So together as a church, let's strive to be jealous for what God is jealous for. Not for what I'm passionate about, not for what any organization is passionate about, but no, let's be passionate for what God is passionate for. I didn't plan to say this, but church, I feel like we're in a season of transition. Many of us are still trying to run this church or operate this church on an old model or something we have in our head. But what God is telling us today is he wants each and every one of you to put aside your preferences, to put aside what you think church should be and really look at the word of God. What am I jealous for? What do I care? What do I love? What do I hate? And if you do that, I promise you, church, just like the people of Israel have been sustained from the beginning till now, you will be kept pure before God. You will be kept holy before God in the coming of the day of Christ. I'm going to end with prayer. Father God, we thank you for this moment, God. I thank you for your church, God. I thank you for your body at large, God. Thank you that everyone sitting here wasn't by their own strength. It wasn't by their own power, God. It was only by the sacrifice you made on the cross, God. Help us to never forget that you were so jealous, God. You were so jealous for us, God that you took on the wrath of God and you paid it with your blood, God. And if there's anyone among us, God, who's living in sin, God, let them be reminded of that hope in Jesus, that you are the one who saved. You are the one who bought them, God. They are sanctified and holy, not because of their works, but because of what you did, Jesus. And for us, God, help us to be so zealous so jealous as a church as a body of Christ that we don't care what people are going to say we don't care what others outside are going to look at us and say we want to be passionate and believing for what you want God we pray that this church be your instrument God it be your way of reaching the lost we thank you so much for this time God we submit ourselves to you Lord in Jesus name amen can we all rise to our feet